Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for having me out all the way from Orange County, California. If any of you are familiar with California, I'm actually about 10 minutes from Laguna Beach, Newport Beach, Huntington Beach, and close to Disneyland. So <clears throat> that's where I'm centered. But I actually do have a bit of a commonality with you guys. I've been in pharma for 23 years. Merck, Bristol Myers Squibb, Allergan, a startup company. And I was down the road in Plainsboro for a couple years working with Bristol Myers Squibb. So not too far from Meriton. So it's actually nice to be back. So this topic today is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. It's also the topic of my doctoral dissertation. So <clears throat> when I looked at all the factors <clears throat> that keep women from advancing, so data's been out for quite some time now about uh, the gap, the leadership gap. And so when I first heard about the data, I was first shocked <laughs> that the numbers are what they are, and I'm going to share those with you today. But I was also intrigued about what's going on. Women have been in the workplace for 40 years now, 40 years, and single digits in the number of women that lead companies. So it's multifactorial. And when I looked at all the different factors, leadership, I looked at emotional intelligence as well, and that's a key driver of leadership effectiveness. And I looked at different aspects of gender, it all boils down to perception. So a number of things drive perception, right? And you're gonna talk about that today at this, this wonderful event. Image drives perception, how you brand yourself, how you present yourself, your behavior, it all drives how people form perceptions. <clears throat> but this is the bottom line, perception impacts promotion. So let's talk about this. So we're gonna to touch on all these topics today. A little bit about each of these, emotional intelligence, the gap. I'll tell you a little bit about my research. We'll talk about the barriers to leadership, what is really keeping women from reaching the upper echelons. Gender culture is a piece that I find most people are unaware of, so we'll touch on that. And then finally, we'll, we'll finish it off with what can you do. Great, so emotional intelligence. So let me ask a show of hands. How many of you are familiar with emotional intelligence? Okay, most of the crowd, correct. It's been around for a few decades now. It's been studied extensively. Here's the formal definition of it. Form of social intelligence. It involves our ability to monitor our own and others' feelings, discriminate against them, and use them to guide our thinking and action. So let me go back here. IQ is your intellectual intelligence, and that stays relatively stable our entire lives. Emotional intelligence increases with age. So as you get more life experiences, that does increase. And that is really the key driver of success in leadership, in business, and in life. It, we know now is emotional intelligence. So, <clears throat> okay, audience participation. Let's see a show of hands. How many of you think men are more emotionally intelligent than women? <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. Usually, you see the guy in the audience is the one who raises his hand, so thank you for being brave and doing that. Okay, so let's see a show of hands. How many of you think women are more emotionally intelligent than men? Okay, vast majority. That is a trick question. The truth is, men and women are equally emotionally intelligent overall. This is in millions of people who's taken EQ assessments worldwide. Overall equal, however, we do differ in gender-specific competencies, and here's what they are. In general, women tend to score higher than men in areas of empathy, social responsibility, and interpersonal relationships, in general. Men tend to score higher than women in areas of assertiveness, independence, and self-regard. What's another name for self-regard? Heard, confidence, absolutely. Men tend to score higher than women in confidence, assertiveness, and independence. Now, <clears throat> one caveat, not all men and women fall into gender-specific patterns. When I first took emotional intelligence assessments, I didn't. I actually was higher in the male-specific attributes, which intrigued me. And when I've given talks, I've had men come up to me afterwards and say, Sean, I'm actually higher in the female. Great. That's perfectly normal. So not all men and women fall into these patterns, but if you look at trends worldwide, this is what we see. Okay, now why is this important? It's important because these gender-specific attributes play a significant role in how we're perceived as leaders in the workplace. Okay, so why care about emotional intelligence? Well, first of all, you'll make more money. Studies have shown that those with higher EQ make 29,000 a year more than their lower EQ counterparts. 
you'll be more successful. EQ has been attributed to 58% of your job performance, success on the job. You'll have deeper relationships. So in this fast-paced, competitive, global world that we live in, <clears throat> relationships are the key driver to the new world economy. How many of you are familiar with the book Thomas Friedman, The World is Flat? Has anyone ever heard that? Okay, great. Three or four people raised their hands. I actually had to read that book in my uh, doc doctoral program. I was fascinated with it. I couldn't put it down because it really talks about the trends we're seeing globally. But what he talks about is that your skills, your, your knowledge can be outsourced. Someone in another country could do your skills faster, better, or cheaper. That's sobering, isn't it? That your skills can be outsourced. So in order to compete and succeed in this fast-paced global economy that we live in, it's about relationships. The quality of your relationships and the depth of your relationships. And that is emotional intelligence. And finally, there's a saying, higher on IQ, fired on EQ. Does anyone know what that might mean? So when you're hired, what do people look at? Exactly, your resume. What's on your resume? Yeah. Everything you've accomplished, so your, your job history, your education history, your accomplishments, your highlights maybe. It's quantitative data for the most part. When you get the job, how well you get along with others and play in the sandbox, that is your emotional intelligence. That's why you're hired on your IQ, but you're fired on your EQ. Or you can keep your job based on your EQ. So <clears throat> uh, it's an important factor. Yes. Higher on, in some cases, on emotional intelligence, only because I think the challenges that a lot of women have at times is not so much the relationships, right, but the right relationships, right, and that whole networking piece, and you know, and how you kind of go deeper with all of that. Women score higher overall than men in interpersonal relationships. Absolutely. <clears throat> Here's an interesting part about that, though: networking. So this is perfect for a, a group like this. Women, men actually, and I think it's safe to say men are generally better networkers because they self-promote. They go around and promote what they're doing to other people. Women tend, to, tend not to do that as much, but women have deeper relationships. So if women just leveraged your relationships alone and expanded your network out, you have the capability to not only have your deep relationships, but a broad, vast network as well. So it's how we're using it. It's how we're using those relationships. So thank you for the comment. OK, so that's, that's the foundation for emotional intelligence to set us up for the rest of the presentation. Let's talk a little bit about the leadership gap. Here are the current numbers. Women now comprise 58% of the US labor force. Over half, about 52% of all management and professional occupations. That includes physician and attorney. 60% of bachelor's degrees at US universities and colleges are now held by women. 60%. 15% of executive officer positions at Fortune 500 companies are women. And here's the number I feel is most impactful. Less than 5% are leading Fortune 500 companies. Okay, so you can see the gap. You can see the disparity. You can no longer say it's historic. We can no longer say, well, women just haven't been in the workforce as long. We can no longer say, well, women aren't as educated. We can no longer say women don't have the work experience. We're there. And the numbers show that. Women are in the workplace. They have experience. They're educated. But less than 5%. And that number, by the way, has barely budged in 30 years. OK, so let's talk about what's going on here. If you do the math, for all the math majors in the room, 4.6% equates to 23 of Fortune 500 companies. So 23 out of 500 women are leading companies. This is a partial list of the women. I'm sure you've heard some of these names. Mary Barra, Meg Whitman at HP, Indira Nui at PepsiCo, Marissa Meyer at Yahoo. I put a special note here on Sheryl Sandberg. She is a COO of Facebook. But when I was in the middle of my dissertation, Lean In came out. How many of you are familiar with Lean In? OK. <laughs> a women's leadership group, I would think you would be. You, you may have Lean In circles. You may have done initiatives around this. You gave the book out, fantastic. <clears throat> so I was unaware of Lean In when I was doing my research. And then I, when I finished, 
I thought, what's this buzz? And I looked in to lean in, and, and many of the same concepts that Cheryl Sandberg talked about, I also cover, I covered in my research. Um, so I give credit to her for bringing the conversation back to the mainstream and helping create a movement. So we have conversations going on globally now, and that's fantastic. So that's the rosy side of this equation. The downside is if you do the math, that leaves 477 men leading Fortune 500 companies. So when you look at it from that perspective, we have a ways to go. OK, a bit about my research. <clears throat> so the problem is women are in the workforce, women are educated, women are equally emotionally intelligent than men. We've already established that. But we have this huge gap. So I studied women at four levels of a Fortune 500 pharmaceutical company. I looked at women at the administrative assistant level, manager, director, and vice president level. I gave them all an EQ assessment followed by in-depth interviews. So it was both quantitative and qualitative. I also looked at women from all different generations, veterans, gen baby boomers, Gen Xers, and millennials as well. Now, the EQ instrument I use is from multi-health systems. It's five major composites, EQ composites, with 15 sub-composites. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to test you on these, but I want you to be familiar with it because there are different EQ models out there. I have color-coded for you in pink and blue. Sorry for the it's a stereotypical there. But I've color-coded for you the ones that men are stronger in and women are stronger in. As you can see, women excel in the interpersonal composite. Inter the relationships, empathy, social responsibility, all three of those women score higher than men. Men, the self-expression composite, assertiveness and independence, and also in the self-perception composite is where those lie. The, all of the rest of these are attributes that are cons considered gender neutral. OK, so my results is that I found, surprisingly, that women in the highest level, the vice president group, were actually higher in the decision making and self-expression composite. So those are the male-specific EQ attributes. I also found that women in the middle manager group were markedly higher in the interpersonal composite. So you may wonder, what's, why, why is this? And I thought the same thing. Well, what it told me is that as women climb the ladder in corporations, we are adapting our, our EQ attributes because that's what's expected of us as both leaders, uh, but by our leadership as well as our direct reports. So women are adapting. And that is commonplace across all industries. And they're adapting because they need to to be perceived as leaders. As a middle manager, you have to get work done through others. And to do that, optimally, you need to leverage those interpersonal relationships. So that's why women in the middle manager group are higher in the female-specific attributes. So I found that fascinating. I also found that the two oldest participants had the highest overall EQ scores, regardless of position. One was a vice president, one was an administrative assistant. So that supports the notion that as you age, so this is the good news, as you age, your, in, your EQ will improve. So you have something to look forward to. <laughs> if, what, except for wrinkles? <laughs> I wish EQ did something for that. <clears throat> OK, I also asked my participants, what had the most impact in your career advancement? And the, the, these five EQ attributes is what they came back with. Assertives, problem solving, self-regard, stress tolerance, and interpersonal relationships. They identified, all the women cross-functionally identified those five as having the most impact. We're going to come back to these at the end. OK, I want to share a few stories with you as well. So in my interviews of these women, those who were naturally higher in the male-specific attributes shared with me that people had a hard time accepting them as leaders because people expected an empathetic woman. So if you happen to be naturally confident and assertive and strong, these women were met with resistance because they expected an empathetic woman. Others shared with me they were told to tone down their assertiveness, be a team player, and be more social. OK? Let me, let's talk about the flip side of the coin now. Let's look at women who are naturally higher in your female-specific attributes. Women who are naturally empathetic share that they're viewed as lacking substance and intelligence and that being analytical and empathetic are mutually exclusive. And I heard this across the board from women at all different levels. Well, of course that's not true. Of course you could be empathetic and analytical and intelligent at the same time. But the perception 
is that if you're empathetic, you, you're not, you may not be the best leader. <clears throat> Other stories I heard for women who are higher in female attributes were that when they did express emotions at work, they uh, were viewed as unstable and unable to handle stress. So one of the VPs shared with me that during her annual performance review with her boss, she started crying. And they talked through it, but at the, after that, she did not get the special assignments or special projects any longer. And why is that? Because he viewed her, because she cried in a performance review, he viewed her as unstable. Now, is she unstable? No, absolutely not. But again, we're talking about perception. That's the perception. So I, I caution you, in the workplace that we live in, it's not always the most embracing environment for emotions. But we're also emotional creatures. Do men display emotions at work? Sure. So what do men display at work, typically? Shout and get angry. Get angry. OK, absolutely. So you see anger expressed at work. Right. So if it's the flip side, whether it's anger, whether it's crying, we form perceptions. And our, our bosses form perceptions. So something to be aware of. So when I, sh when I share these stories with you about male and female, does anything come to mind? Like, what's your initial, what's your impression? Yes. Oh, perfect. Perfect. I just I don't know if I can re I don't know if I can repeat that on camera. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that comment, but it seems like lose lose for women. You know, either way. That's right. That's right. She, you both both had the same answer. Her response was damned if you do, damned if you don't. Sorry for cursing. And same response. That is exactly the that's exactly the issue. So. OK, if you're a successful woman, you're in a corporate America, you've been in your job 10 years, you've done well, you get good performance reviews. Whether you're high in male or female attributes, you're met with resistance either way. So just something to be aware of. It's often difficult for women in particular in the workplace because of perceptions. And so what's driving these perceptions? Let's talk about that. That's the barriers. <clears throat> OK, first of all, we have structural barriers. These are lack of access to informal networks. What's another word for an informal network? You got it, old boys club. OK, that's a perfect example of an, an informal network. Lack of female role models, lack of female mentors, lack of male sponsors. These are all considered structural obstacles. They've been around for decades, and they still are prevalent and persistent today. <clears throat> OK, another type of obstacle is institutional mindsets. <laughs> like this. OK, we have gender, we have stereotypes, right? We hold gender stereotypes, of course. Not all men are, are driven by sex and sports, right? Not all women are driven by chocolate and shopping. But we have stereotypes that we hold. Um, gender bias, gender stereotyping. Also in this category is agentic leader behavior. So what that is, is when you think of a leader, what comes to mind? What, what qualities? Just off the top of your head. What was that? Charisma. Charisma, OK. What else? Strength. Strength, OK. What else, when you think of a leader, what comes to mind? Confidence. Confidence. Anything else? Decisive. Visionary. OK, excellent, excellent. So the reason I asked you that is most people, men and women, when we think of a leader, it's generally male traits. I usually hear confident. I hear assertiveness. I hear competitiveness, decisiveness. Um, those are generally associated with male traits. You n rarely, if ever, hear empathy interpersonal relationships, social responsibility. You, you don't hear of the female attributes. That is a type of bias that we all hold. Role congruity theory drives a lot of our bias as well. What role congruity theory is, is deep-seated beliefs that we hold about a population, and about um, behaviors they need, someone needs to succeed to be successful in the role. So let me give you an example. Male nurses. 
Okay, a man could be a fantastic nurse, but he may not always be met positively by those around him because he's in a role considered to be incongruent with his gender. Okay, here's another example, female leaders in the military. Again, a woman could be a fantastic leader in the military, but she may not always be met positively by those she leads because she's in a role incongruent with a woman. That is role congruity theory. That also drives a lot of our beliefs about what leaders should be. Institutional mindsets, by the way, is, is the most, these are deep-seated, these have been around for generations and decades, and it's gonna take generations to change these. And individual mindsets is another type of barrier. This is, includes um, women holding themselves back. So you would think, well, why do women do this? A myriad of reasons. Sometimes it's, it could be confident, lack of confidence or assertiveness. Sometimes it's women just want other things. I, I heard quite a, uh, frequently that women often look at the politics at the top and say, I don't want that. I don't want any part of that. Uh, and also just other interests in general. So women hold themselves back. The data shows that women tend to get to the director position and start falling off for different reasons. They self-select out of the workforce or they participate in office housework. And this is the one I, I actually recently added this because uh, there was a piece done in um, uh, New York Times, uh, a series, and office housework was talked about. I think it's a fantastic example and I've put it in individual mindsets because it's in keeping with gender stereotypes. So what might you think office housework is? Getting coffee. Taking notes, excellent. Email oriented roles, okay. Oh, female oriented roles, okay. Cool, good one, I haven't heard that before. Cleaning up after a meeting. Planning parties, excellent. Picking up the donuts, picking up the cupcakes. These are all administrative, behind-the-scenes tasks that are important for any organization to run smoothly. But women are often the ones who volunteer for these types of activities. Men tend to volunteer for activities that are more visible. Women tend to volunteer for the office housework. So I just want you to be mindful of this. Um, a suggestion for you is if you're planning a function or a meeting, ask, don't ask for volunteers, assign it. Because if you ask for volunteers, the woman for the most part is going to volunteer for that because we want to be helpful, right? Women do this because we want to be helpful. And we're, again, we're in keeping, we're unconsciously keeping with gender stereotyping. So, um, so that is a part of individual mindsets. And then finally, we have lifestyle choices. Breadwinner, caregiver, work-life balance, and family choices. So this also drives a lot of the reason that women are not at the upper echelons of leadership. Breadwinner, caregiver, the example that I like to give here is if a man is the, if a, um, if a woman is the primary breadwinner, she's usually the primary caregiver, right? If a man's the primary breadwinner, he's rarely the primary caregiver. That is a key difference that has to be in an important decision that has to be addressed by the family and how they're going to address that moving forward. And this, this affects women throughout their whole careers is the breadwinner caregiver issues, lifestyle, family choices. And as long as women are having the children, and I don't think that's changing anytime soon. <laughs> are any of you biologists here? Uh, this is gonna be an issue. So women also want different things. Women, it's clear that women are confronted with issue, issues that men do not have to face. As a result, many women have opted for the private sector, nonprofits, and startup companies. So Barriers are minimized in these companies, and these are just some examples here. You would have less of the gender bias and stereotyping. You would have more female mentors, more role models, um, and more leadership support to help women advance and develop. So it's, n it's not surprising, right? It's not surprising that women are opting for, for other options. But um, So that's just something else to keep in mind. Okay, so why remove these barriers? So we've talked about it's a lot of barriers here. Well, it's the full promise of equal opportunity. It's, it will give you more uh, potential can, um, candidates. So this is for any organization that wants to succeed in business, is, is, is organizations are not tapping into their uh, talent inherent in their employees. If you have 50% or more women, but you have less than 5% leading in your company, you're clearly not tapping into that talent. That talent is not being developed. 
So you have a more pool of candidates. Of course, diversity uh, would be more representation, representative of society. And there is a very strong research connection um, between diversity and financial performance. Um, also, one last comment about the barriers. This is a global phenomenon. It's not just US. Women are disproportionately concentrated in lower level and lower authority positions than men worldwide. So only until we start chipping away at some of these barriers and they're minimized will we see women going to raising, rising to leadership in large numbers. Any questions or comments about the barriers? That's actually quite a large piece and, and, and it's the reasons why we see the, the leadership numbers that we do. Okay. All right. Now, if emotional intelligence, if the barriers, the leadership gap, if all that's not enough, I'm going to add one more layer on top. Gender culture differences. Did you know that we have different gender cultures that we're raised in? Let's talk about it. OK, I think this pretty much sums it up. So I really don't need any more slides. I mean, doesn't that, OK. I'm just kidding. Uh, the mission, go to Gap, buy a pair of pants. You see the, man li the male lines the blue, the meandering red lines the female. Six minutes, $33, mission accomplished. Man's got his pants. Three and a half hours later, over $800, a woman has her pants. So now, again, just a whimsical look at differences, how we're hardwired. But let's take a more serious look at how this shows up in the workplace. It's not about rights and wrongs, it's about difference. We are raised in different cultures and we're trying to do the right things but by two different sets of rules. Male gender rules and female gender rules. We have differences in how we work within a structure, network, conduct meetings, interpret information, take risks, work in teams, how we lead. Virtually every aspect of business we approach differently. Let me give you some examples here. OK, let's, let's start it when we're children. What are the games boys play? What was that? Uh, no, I was just like, oh, my god. Every oh. single thing is a weapon. <laughs> OK, <laughs> everything's a weapon. OK, so games with weapons, OK. What are, what are other games boys play? Anything with a ball, OK, so sports. Video games? What was that? Anything blue? OK. Oh, collecting things, OK. Well, you guys have some, you have some different ones here I haven't heard before. So, it, so boys, so yeah, you got it. So we've heard sports, we've heard like weapons, military games. Oftentimes I hear, you know, cops and robbers and things like that. What boys learn very early on is competitive. They learn, they learn win, lose scenarios. You win, you lose, and when the game's over, you're friends again. So win, lose scenarios, and they're taught to be competitive. Let's look at the games girls play. Princess, dress up, dolls, house, tea party. Excellent, excellent. Okay, what do girls learn? The, the lessons girls are taught very early on is to avoid conflict and to get along with an even distribution of power. You don't have win-lose scenarios. You can't lose at Barbies. It's not possible, right? You can't lose at Barbies. So. Unconsciously, we're taught these lessons early on, avoiding conflict, getting along. Also, women are taught to negotiate very early on. You have to share, and it's about relationships. The value we put on things is about relationships. The value boys are taught is about winning. OK, let's take that into the workplace. We have differences in how we conduct meetings. So men tend to, before a meeting, go around to all the key players and get their ducks in a row prior to the meeting and get alignment in general. Men tend to do this. Well, a woman doesn't know this. In her gender culture, what she does is she shows up to the meeting, ready to dialogue with everyone in the room. Unbeknownst to her, the meeting's really already happened. 
Now again, men and women are doing what's right in their gender cultures. So, and again, it's not about rights and wrongs, it's just about a difference that I want you to be aware of. Let's talk about at the meetings. At meetings, men, too, men tend to lead, they tend to speak up, talk in a declamatory voice, and interrupt. Women in meetings tend to raise their hands, smile more, nod, and wait their turn. Have you seen this? <laughs> I, see, I see a lot of heads nodding. OK, this is just one example of gender, subtle gender cultural differences. Let me give you some more. The way we talk is different. Let's look at success and blame. In general, men tend to, when it comes to success, point inward. And when it comes to failure, point outward. It was external factors. It was, it was other circumstances. What do women do? Just the opposite. When it comes to success, women point outward. It was my team. It was the people on my project that I worked with. When women fail, where do they point? Inward. It's just the opposite. Networking is different. Men tend to go around and network with uh, their bosses on a continual basis about what they're doing. In sharp contrast, a woman tends to stay in her office, working away at her computer, hoping to be noticed. Well, what's the result? Three months down the line, when a hiring manager has a, a position on his or her team, who do they think of? The person's been in their office six times in the last three months, and that's generally the male. Again, not about rights and wrongs, but about different approaches. But different approaches have very different impact. Listening, we also have differences there. Women, uh, are, men tend to, when they're listening, they tend to only nod when they're in agreement. Women, in sharp contrast, tend to nod. It doesn't mean a woman is agreeing with you when she's nodding. It means, I hear you, keep going. Now, I know this because I'm a nodder. Whenever I talk to people, I'm always nodding. I may not be agreeing, but I'm saying, I'm with you, so keep going. So women tend to do this more than men. OK, what's the potential result? The potential result it may be that women may just, just be agreeable to everything, whereas a man sits back and then nods when he agrees. It, the perception is a man may be more decisive. Again, differences, not rights and wrongs, but, but keep those in mind. And then verbals and nonverbals. Men tend to be better at picking up verbals. Women tend to be better at picking up nonverbals. And finally, leadership. We do have differences in how we lead. You may have heard these terms, transactional, transformational. Yeah. Especially trans transformational. There's been a lot done in the last few years on that. Men tend to be more transactional in their leadership style. What this is is an even exchange of, of, of um, ideas or favors, basically. I'll do this for you, you do this for me. I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. A woman, transformational leadership is based on lower or even levels of cooperation and collaboration and collective problem solving and decision making. Women tend to be better at that than men. Also, there is data, a lot of data to show that in our society that we live in now, very competitive society, that transformational leadership is the type of leadership we need. So there is a place for both. There is a place for transactional at times, but again, in our highly matrixed, highly competitive world, transformational leadership has shown to be more effective. Okay, so what's the take home of all this? Very different perceptions by not only coworkers, but by leaders but very real impact on promotion. And some of you may have, may have felt this yourselves, personally. As far as the gender culture differences, here's a few suggestions for you. Reinterpret the opposite gender's intent. If, if, if a man does something and you just scratch your head and like, what was he thinking? Think about what he's doing that's appropriate for his gender culture. He is probably acting in a way that's completely normal and appropriate for his gender culture. So, First of all, reinterpret before making assumptions. Flex your style, so modify your behavior to be in sync with what's appropriate in the other person's gender culture. This goes for men as well, if you're working with women. And then lastly, talk about our differences. That is the only way we're going to, to, to get around some of these subtle differences. OK. Here's another suggestion for you. Does anyone recognize this woman? Who is she? I'll give you a hint. She has one of the most popular TED Talks. 
Oh, really? <laughs> Someone said Harvard? That's right. Yes. Excellent. Power pose like Dr. Amy Cuddy. So I had the pleasure of meeting her last year at a conference. So backstage after her, her, her keynote, I went to her and I shared with her my research on leadership and gender. And I said, OK, Dr. Cuddy, you got to explain this to me. You're saying that by power posing, we're doing the starfish, by the way, in this picture. Starfish, you're expansive, arms up, chest out. If you hold a, a pose such as that for two minutes, she showed that it increases testosterone and lowers cortisol levels. So it gives you a feeling of power, even if you're not feeling powerful at the time. So that's the starfish. There's also the Wonder Woman pose. And there's a few others that, that she studied at Harvard. But she found scientific proof behind this. So my question for her was that, well, if you're saying power is high testosterone, then are you saying that men are better leaders because they have more testosterone? She goes, no, absolutely not. She goes, it's all about the, rel your, uh, it's not about your, your basal level of testosterone. It's not about the starting level. It's about the difference relative. So it has nothing to do with the fact that men have more testosterone. It has to do with the change in testosterone relative to your, your, basal, your base level. So basically, I was very happy with her answer <laughs> that, whew, actually, scientifically even, there's no differences in, as a, in, um, in our, our effectiveness as leaders. So this, I bring this up because if you're a woman who happens to be lower in confidence or assertiveness, here is something that you can do. It only takes a couple minutes. You can do it in the bathroom before a presentation or before a big meeting, before an interview. You can go off to the side and power pose. And um, there's their scientific fact behind it. So I like to include it in here because it's something easy that women can do. And actually men, too, if, if you want a, a, a boost. OK, assertiveness. So, Remember those five EQ attributes I shared with you earlier that the participants I studied, I asked them, what's had the most impact in your career? Assertiveness was number one, being more assertive. And assertiveness is not aggressiveness, by the way. It's finding that sweet spot between what you want and what others want. So here's one suggestion in the next two weeks, write down situations where you have behaved assertively, passively, or aggressively. Do you see patterns? Do you see trends? And what were the reasons you weren't assertive? So that's one suggestion for you for assertiveness. For self-regard or confidence, have conversations with people you respect. Uh, what do they see as your strengths and weaknesses? And let go of negative self-talk. I've added that, particularly for women. Women tend to be much harder uh, on themselves when it comes to negative self-talk than men are. So let go of that. Let go of the negative self-talk because it's, it's, it can underlie your confidence. So have conversations with people you respect. As far as interpersonal relationships, if you need a boost in this area, identify someone with you whose relationship is ineffective. Meet and arrive at an action plan to support one another's mutual needs. I love that, because most people don't do that. If you have someone where, where you have an ineffective relationship, most people just avoid it, <laughs> right? <laughs> But if you actually sit down and say, hey, you know, I know we've had some differences. I really want to work with you on this. And I want to you know, get to know you better. How can we help each other out? How can we help each other meet our mutual needs? I, I guarantee you, 100% of the time, they're going to be response, or receptive to that. Problem solving. Here's a suggestion for you to create more opportunities to solve problems with others instead of taking it all on yourself. You can organize teams that deal with problems as they arise. And then finally, stress tolerance. I know that, that's one stressed out kitty, isn't it? Uh, do someone a favor. It allows you to shift from being a problem solver or a problem sufferer to a problem solver. So I, I love that. And it helps you put problems in perspective. So that's one easy thing you can do to help manage your stress. OK, finally, well, any questions on that? Any questions on those five? And those are just some suggestions. If you've had emotional intelligence training before, uh, or if you have books, there's been a lot of books written on it, there's a lot of things you can do. But these, these areas, uh, again, my participants identified as be having the most impact on their advancement as a woman. The last question I asked in my research was, what advice would you give to other women in terms of their career advancement? And 
and I have, I love put all of them up there because I think they're all important. First of all, improve your confidence. Be confident, not so hard on yourself. Improve your assertiveness. Don't be afraid to ask for what you want. Impro improve your problem solving. Bring more value to your organization. Improve your self-actualization. That's your pursuit of dreams, your pursuit of your goals, the pursuit of meaning. That's self-actualization. Do what you really want to do. If you're not in a role you're not satisfied with, talk to people. Look at other options. Improve your stress tolerance. <clears throat> Think things through. Don't take it all on yourself. They also say control your emotional expression. That example I gave you earlier of the VP who, who cried during her performance review. Don't overly rely on emotions at work. We're, we're not robots. We are emotional creatures. And it's perfectly fine to express emotions when you can. But just be cautious about perceptions that it could cause if you overly express. And then finally, my favorite one is don't lose your empathy. It's important and people appreciate it. Empathy is the one EQ competency. Women are markedly higher than men, almost three times as high as men in empathy. That is a strength that women have naturally that you can leverage. And especially as leaders, as you're, if you're in a leadership role now or coming up to leadership roles, keep that. Because the leaders that are empathetic are the best leaders. And their teams love them for it. And their teams will follow them anywhere because of it. OK, I wanted to add this, especially for a women's leadership group. OK, networking, mentoring, branding, image, all the professional development that you've taken in your career, enhancing your EQ skills, that's all important to excel in your current roles and help you move to the next role. But in order to get to the senior leadership levels, you have to have business, strategic, and financial acumen. And I bring this up because men, where do, women generally are not taught this. Let me ask, let me see by a show of hands. How many of you have ever been taught business, strategic, or financial acumen? OK, about a dozen. Yeah, about a dozen of you. So in, uh, in research, you may wonder, well, how do men get it? Men get it through informal networking and through mentoring. Men are being taught about the business. So what this is is knowing your business inside and out, knowing your competitors, knowing the big picture of your company and where it's going, the major strategies and priorities, knowing what your role is and how it impacts those strategies, and finally, what's the financial impact? What's the financial impact of what your role is to the company? So if you can think in those terms, that, that's particularly important to get you to senior leadership roles, because that seems to be the missing ingredient. So in addition to all the other activities that we do, keep doing them. They're fantastic. But I'd like to keep that in mind as well, business, strategic, and financial acumen. So in conclusion, perception impacts promotion. Perception comes from a variety of sources, as we discussed today. And it has a significant impact, particularly on women. And it contributes to the gap that we see. So yes, there's a big gap, huge gap. Yes, there are significant barriers. Yes, there are EQ differences. And yes, there are gender culture differences. But I want you to be encouraged, because there's a movement going on globally. There's more dialogue and more corporate pressure than ever before on being put on diversity. And you see it almost every week in the paper. Silicon Valley is under tight scrutiny about number of women they have on their leadership and their boards. Many companies in all industries are about, uh, under um, scrutiny about being more diverse and inclusive. So there's a movement. Women are educated, experienced, and empowered. And new generations are bringing new attitudes. The recent data shows that millennial men actually have the same attitudes towards work-life balance as women have had for decades. That's fantastic news. So we're starting to see a shift. We're starting to see a leadership shift here in how millennials are viewing leaders and how millennials are viewing women as well. Oh, and I also, your own self-perception is critically important. So I've added that. So I want to leave you with this today. Be encouraged. We're slowly making gains. Be persistent. Don't give up on your aspirations. And finally, speak up for what you really care about. And with that, I wish you every success in your careers. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> OK, so.
So, um, oh, great, great. So I think we have a mic going around. If you have questions about anything I've talked about today, it, nothing's off, off limits, so please ask. Um, I do want to share with you here, so I have a website, and I've included my email, LinkedIn, and Twitter. I encourage you, if you want to link in with me, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, also, if you're interested in getting links to articles that have been published, I've published on these topics, I'd be happy to send you those links. So if you want to give me your business card afterwards, I can give you my card as well. I'd be happy to email you those links. So, okay, questions? Hi, my name is Cindy Boykin. You've presented very well. My question is, you mentioned the different barriers that women have um, in competitive as well as um, different attributes than men. How do you break those barriers other than the things that you have listed? All the barriers? Or some in general, um, quick barriers. Um, well, they're quite a ways back, so instead of going back to them. Um, well, first, awareness is the first thing. Uh, when I, I find when I present on these topics, as, as people like, oh, yeah. You know, that some of the barriers are out there, but, but most folks aren't aware of all the, the whole myriad of barriers. Because there, there's a lot of them, and they're multifactorial. So first of all, awareness is key. Two, men are critically important to be part of the conversation. We have to have men. Women's groups are great, and we need women's groups for development, for support, for mentoring, for resources. But men, again, going looking at the 4.6%, if you have 477 men leading Fortune 500 companies, men are in positions of decision-making and power. Men have to be part of the conversations. So having an awareness and dialoguing about the issues and the barriers also, HR plays a critically important role here. Your HR department and your talent development, uh, talent management departments, because be when they're talking about succession planning and developing up and coming leaders, behind closed doors, they should be having very serious conversations about why there is a lack of women in the pipeline and also at the leadership levels. So that's another thing: is, is HR needs to be having candid conversations behind closed doors, and then having the uh, development programs in place to help develop that pipeline of, of women coming up. So, yeah. Hi, Leanne Forbes. Um, Hi. You talked about the global phenomenon of the disproportionate number of men at the top. Um, are there any countries that do it well, that have a more equal? Uh, yes, actually, that's a great question. Uh, the Scandinavian countries are the best countries in the world for women. Uh, and I think... Sweden is number one. I think Sweden's one followed closely by Norway. Um, Finland's up there. But as far as women in leadership roles and senior leadership roles, yeah, the Scandinavian countries uh, far outpace the US. Um, well, differences in mindsets is, is a, a big part of it. Um, as I mentioned, those those institutional mindsets, those bias, the stereotyping, those are held by men and women. We're raised with that. We're, that that's ingrained in us. And, a lot, and most of the times, we're unaware of it. Most of the times, it's unconscious bias that's occurring. Um, but it's, those biases are more prevalent in the US. And like so, some of the European countries in particular, it's, it's not as big of a deal. You know, the role congruity issues where I mentioned, I gave the example of the male nurses and the female leaders in the military. You know, we still have that. I mean, I mean we still have race related, you know, we still have racial issues in the US as well. But um, we still hold on to some of these biases, and the biases are more ingrained in our society and our culture than they are in other countries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my mic on. Um, just a quick question. Maybe you could give all of us some advice. I think one of the challenges, especially for women in trying to be in a leadership role, is delegating. Mm. We tend to take on a lot uh, that maybe we should learn to delegate better. Um, what advice can you give uh, women in a leadership role in learning to delegate, especially maybe when men are at the table and, and we're in that type of a situation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let go of the control is one. Women tend to take more on themselves than men do. Uh, women tend to put more pressure on themselves as well. So realizing that, I mean, 
well, you can't be super women. Unfortunately, we can't be. I mean, many women have tried it over the millennials with raising families and having careers. It's very difficult. Um, realize that you can't do it all, and that you, and, and again, women are help, women tend to want to help, which is fa a fantastic quality that women have. But in the workplace, letting go, letting go of some of that, that need to control, letting go of the helpfulness factor, and allowing others to be part of your team. And so I would actually reframe how we look at delegating to it's an opportunity for other people. And, it's, it's a, and it, we know that delegating also is a, it's an essential leadership quality. To be effective, you, you can't do everything. You have to delegate to your team members. But it's, it's, I think it's utilizing your team's strengths. Let, let your team shine. You know, so just reframing how we look at it, letting go of the control, and allowing your teams, you know, leveraging your team's strengths and letting them shine by delegating. I'm just interested with your research, if you found any research besides EQ and besides like performance, obviously, what are the other factors that actually lead into pr promotion at work? <clears throat> Tell me a little bit more. Like okay. for, for example, you know, obviously someone's performance goes into whether or not they get promoted at work and their EQ does. But I think I've been told a number of times, for example, that a woman's look is something like her physical appearance is also something that gets it, this is part of the unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. So I guess what are some of those other aspects that we could be aware of besides EQ that might be a derailer that we're not thinking of? Oh, uh Actually, that ties right into your theme, I think, for this, for your leadership forum now. Um, so other than EQ, okay, so being aware of, um, it, first of all, if you haven't had an emotional intelligence assessment, it, it's, it's easy. They range from $25 to $55, and you get robust assessments. So first of all, knowing where you stand from an emotional intelligence perspective and knowing what areas are your strengths from an EQ perspective and what areas you can develop. I think, so that's, that's one thing. Being aware of the, the uh, data I talked about today, the gender culture differences, the being aware of the barriers just alone, um, talking with other people about it, so dialoguing again. But then you have other factors too, that you know, image, you have branding, you have your, your 30 second elevator speech, all that, all that, all that, all of this stuff plays into perception. So what I find most fascinating about all this is it's not, it's not really about competencies. It's not really about performance. Everything I've talked about today comes back to perception. That perception is what's harming women, and that perception is what's keeping women from advancing into those leadership roles. So uh, I also think it's very important not to put 100% of responsibility on women. And the onus, the onus should not be on women's shoulders to change and to do all these things. We need to have leadership support behind, behind it. You need to have HR support behind it. You need to have men support. Male sponsors are very important. Um, just one quick example there. Why are male sponsors important versus female sponsors? The reason is, let's say, let's say there's a boardroom, and a VP or a president chimes in and says, I think Sally would be great for this position. Sally should be promoted. Well. The perception is that she may be supporting Sally because Sally's a woman. She's just another woman. If Bob speaks up and Bob says, I think Sally should be promoted, she's fantastic. The reality is that oftentimes holds more credence than the woman because a man is backing a woman. And again, this is about perceptions and bias, yes, but we need male sponsors. We need males to sponsor females as well. So that's another point, and I think um, you know, together, HR and your talent development department needs to have uh, a role in, in all this to help minimize the barriers and, and help mitigate the perceptions. <clears throat> 